even though the guy that taught me said, you know, you need to, and a lot of bladesmith, you know, you, you need to draw out your design. Um, that's just not the way my brain works. I can draw something out. It's not going to look the same. So I just take a piece of steel. I kind of have in my mind what I want to do. And at the end of the day, I allow the steel to talk to me. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from thenifejunkie.com. Welcome to the show. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here on episode number 19, another great interview coming up. Yep. But, Bob, before we get into the interview and the podcast, this is audio. I do want to remind our listeners that The Knife Junkie has a YouTube channel, and you had a couple of great videos come out this week that I want to kind of give you a chance to talk about. And, again, remind folks that uh, they need to check out the YouTube channel as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, two great knives that came out recently that have uh, have been, uh, you know, causing a bit of a of a stir. Uh, I got my hands on and um, made a couple of videos of the GEC number six Pemberton. It's a teeny tiny little scalpel of a Warncliffe right. single blade, beautiful little knife, the smallest slip joint I have, actually. You actually dropped it in the video because it was I so don't... small. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And of course, I worry, did I nick it? Did I break the tip off, but it was close enough to the surface of the desk. It was no problem. Uh, and then uh, and then I also got my hands on the Cold Steel AD-10, the uh, production interpretation of the classic Andrew Demko custom knife. And I got to tell you, it is an amazing, amazing knife. And it, it makes me wonder why he would even let Cold Steel build such a beautiful and faithful reproduction of his custom knife. Because, uh, you know, if I ever had the goal of picking up a real AD-10, uh, it it's been it's been pushed back or backburnered by this amazing cold steel production. Well, you know, Bob, I, I looked at that video. I was watching that video. It is a great looking knife and tease our listeners a little bit. We have an announcement that relates to that video, but you have to wait till after the interview and we'll talk about that. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, let's talk about it after. Okay. All right. Sounds like a great plan. Just a reminder, folks, uh, this is tax season, and unfortunately, it's something we have to do. But QuickBooks Self-Employed is your year-round tax solution. It's a must-have if you're a contractor, a freelancer, if you're self-employed. If you go to the knifejunkie.com slash QB30, Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. So for 30 days for free, just go to the knifejunkie.com slash QB30. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. So welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Today I'm speaking with Adam Porras. Adam is a knife forger and owner of a forge in Northern Virginia that, uh, well, really specializes in something interesting. And I'll let him tell the, tell the story to you. Uh, I met him uh, during a work project fortuitously, and uh, I'm really happy it brings him to the Knife Junkie podcast. First of all, Adam, you are a veteran. I wanted to thank you for your service before we even start off. Well, thank you for your support. Oh, my pleasure. So uh, tell me a little bit about your military background and tell us where you served and what branch, what role, that kind of thing. I joined the Army in 92, right out of high school. I did a little over 20 years. Uh, I started out in the infantry. I was an uh, infantryman for 11 and about 12 and a half years, and uh, I hurt my shoulder while stationed in Hawaii, and I was medically reclassed, or I, I, I was medically, basically I changed my job due to medical reasons, and I was made a paralegal uh, for the last seven and a half or so years uh, of my career. Uh, throughout my career, I've served, I would say I have a dotted line around the world stretching from uh, Russia all the way back around. Uh, and, uh, so I've served everywhere from, uh, I was stationed in Korea, served in, in South America. I served in the Caribbean basin doing humanitarian operations there, uh, peacekeeping operations in Kosovo, uh, and combat operations in, uh, both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and all, all that kind of basically in a nutshell encompasses the, the, the 20 years, 18 some odd countries that I've been to. Uh, so I, I, I got to. Got to, got to go around the world, so it was kind of fun. So you served in combat roles, administrative roles, uh, support, intelligence, all sorts of different roles. Um, this is the Knife Junkie podcast, and we we're about to talk about uh, your life in knives. Uh, but before we do, when you're in the Army, what kind of knives do they issue you, and, and what do you generally use them for? 
we're, we're issued uh, a, basically a bayonet, which is just a, a fancy eyes uh, Bowie knife. And uh, that's that's basically all that we're issued. Everything else I kind of you know bought on my own. Uh, I didn't start making knives until after I retired. So I would always buy my own knives uh, or something or other. Uh, if I would have been making them back then, I would have saved a lot of money, but, uh, you know, just your, your basic Gerber's and your, your, your normal every day that they have at the, at the post exchange or, or clothing sales that you can get. Well, I think a lot of people think, uh, military, they think combat all the time, but, uh, I would imagine in the army, a lot of the things you're issued, like your knives are just used for mundane things, opening up MREs, that kind of thing, uh, crates and packages. Yeah, pretty much. So tell me a little bit about uh, you were diagnosed with PTSD. When when was that, and what was that due to? Uh, I was officially diagnosed uh, with PTSD in 2011, and that was just uh, a, a, a myriad of of different uh, all my all my services kind of different combinations. Whether it be as I always say, when 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 you kind of see ethnic cleansing and uh, it kind of, when you kind of see it at at, at a personal level, you you kind of it sticks with you. Uh, and of course, in the army, we're taught, uh, regardless of the job, we're taught to compartmentalize mm-hmm. stuff. So we kind of just push it down and just kind of lays there. And then one day it's like, hey, hello, I'm here. And you have to learn to to deal with it. Uh, you know, they it's like they always say, they teach us to go to war. They teach us to make war, but they don't really teach us how to recover from war. So the official diagnosis, even though I knew it was a long time coming, was in 2011. Uh, and shortly thereafter, I was also diagnosed with the traumatic brain injury that I had sustained when I was in uh, Afghanistan that, again, I really wasn't sure what it was. I just, you know, started having really bad headaches and they wouldn't go away. And I, I always joke that I have the, the record for the longest headache. It, it stretches back to 2010 and you know, oh. it's still going. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the nexus of, of, of my two major, uh, injuries. I also have, uh, I think I can't remember if I told you that I have, have a broken back. Uh, or a, I have wedge fractures in my back, which equates to a broken back in simple terms. I have wedge fractures in my back and my neck and again, sustained from my time in Afghanistan. It's just something I've learned to deal with. And all that started with that one diagnosis of PTSD and then seeing the, the doctors more and more. So somewhere along the way, you discovered that creativity was a good way for you to heal. How did you stumble upon knife forging? Tell me, tell me about that. Tell me how learning to forge knives helped you. Actually, a uh, an old friend of mine, uh, he had been going to uh, a guy that he knew on post had been going to. He called it blade therapy. He kept encouraging me, and eventually, uh, both me and my wife Donna, which you remember meeting, yes. uh, decided to go, and that's kind of where we picked it up. And I learned that once I started forging, it kind of provided me a uh, an outlet to 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 do something. Uh, in the military, regardless of branch, you're, you're, you know, you're given an objective. You're, 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 you're given steps to get to the objective. That's basically knife making, uh, blade smithing, as, as, as it's uh, more better known. Blade smithing, that's all it is. It's just, it's, a, it's taking certain steps from, you know, how long to heat and how, how many times to hit and whatnot, and you end up with a finished product. So you have an objective, which is a, a, a some sort of bladed instrument or a, as I call it, a knife shaped object. Mm. You start with a piece of raw steel and you got to get from point A to point B. And there's steps to take. And that, that kind of resonated a lot with both me and my wife, uh, who's also a combat vet. I think I remember telling you about yes. that. Uh, and uh, it just kind of resonated with both of us. And that's just kind of we, we just kind of picked it up from there. And uh, we, we've been going uh, ever since. So that creative act, the getting lost in making of knives do you feel that that is something that has helped you um, begin to heal some of the PTSD? Uh, yeah, it, it gives me something to do. It gives me something to do with my hands, uh, and it it's a it's a repetitive process. And it just you just like you said, you can get lost in in the whole process. And like I said, you you end up with a with with, with the finished product. And it's, it's just the process that helps out. You get to escape your head for a little while. Yeah. Well, you're concerned about issues of temperature and steel and moving steel and grinding steel. Maybe primarily not burning myself or setting myself on fire, but you know, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, other right. stuff works too. So <laughs> this is what we're getting to. Tell us about Recovery Forge. What is Recovery Forge? Tell us about its genesis and who it aims to help. Uh, well, we started Recovery Forge uh, a couple of years ago. 
I guess going on three years now, the guy that originally had taught me, we had helped him start uh, a what was called uh, Resilience Forge. Uh, we went our separate ways and me and my wife decided that we like what we were doing. And we decided we started Recovery Forge to basically teach the basics of bladesmithing, some decorative blacksmithing, but mainly the basics of bladesmithing to veterans, active duty or any 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 form of military uh, veterans, wounded warriors, first responders, just police and fire, their families and caregivers. And that's basically the premise of it. We we saw that it helped us and we figured there's got to be others that are tired of the traditional art therapies, you know, the the painting your emotions, mm-hmm. the this or that, which all all work as well, but not everybody is just into it. Might that. not be as relevant to a to a combat vet. Yeah. Yeah. And so we started this initially here at home at our house, a little in, in our townhouse. Our neighbors are uh, very patient uh-huh. with us. Uh, and we linked up with the workhouse, which is where you found us uh, last year. And we've been we finished our first year there. Uh, but, yeah, Recovery Forge is just teaching basic bladesmithing and allowing other vets, whether they're combat or not, just a place to come and be amongst like-minded people. That's the biggest thing with veterans, especially combat mm-hmm. veterans. We like to be around like-minded people. And that's that. That's what both me and my wife wanted to offer when, when we started Recovery Forge. So you're all starting, you're all there, you're all starting from a certain point. You don't have to explain yourselves or explain necessarily where you're where you're coming from. There's a, a bit of understanding already built in. Yeah, basically. And like we, we encourage people, if you want to talk, you can. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to. Uh, it just, you know, it's it's up to the individual there. What kind of feedback have you gotten from uh, from people who've come? Well, we've gotten fairly positive feedback uh, late into our season. Uh, it was after me and you ha- had done our thing. Uh, we linked up with a, a chaplain from Fort Belvoir, a, a unit chaplain. And uh, he, him, his wife, and her friend came out one weekend just to see what it was about. They forged, you know, couple, their, their own blades. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to be bringing you, you know, some people next weekend. Well, the following weekend, he showed up with 23 families. Whoa. And, 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 and when I say families, I mean husband, wife, sons of all ages, daughters of all ages. They showed up as like, hey, we're here to learn. And I'm like, okay, I didn't think I could handle 23 families at the same time. But uh, at the end of the day, we had a total of, uh, I think, nine kids ranging from, I don't know, seven to 18, I guess. They had all forged, done the done the the basic rough forging by the end of that day, and we had wow. started their parents in on that. And from that, we got that's the largest amount uh, of people that we had. We'd been getting positive feedback beforehand. We had our regulars, mm-hmm. and from that, the chaplain's like, "You don't understand. These are only the twenty three that I chose." He's like, "You're you're going to be getting, I think, like sixty people answered him." He's like, "I, I was like, okay, I can't bring all of y'all, so I'm going to choose X amount." So wow. come this season, we have more people coming. I mean, it, it got to the point that they wanted to continue us doing it. But, you know, the winter, we can't. You, you've seen our, our setup. We sure, do everything sure. outdoors. Well, let, let's talk about that for a second because you're talking about 23 families. I mean, I can't imagine. I was there with uh, – well, I'll just, I'll describe it. Uh, but I was there with a with a, a crew of three people. It was a camera crew of three people. And, and it was not tight because it's outside in the courtyard. But – uh, you know, well, talk about a little bit about your forge. Tell tell us about your equipment. What do you have? Like you described, it's a courtyard. It's it's an open area behind a, a building at one of one of the wings at the forge ho- at the uh, workhouse. And what I have is at the time you were there, we we kind of we had to up our game a little bit after you left because we, we uh, uh, some reason I was like, if we're going to expand on this, we expand on this. But currently, I have five grinders, uh, one, uh, one by thirty. Four uh, two by forty twos and one that big blue two by seventy two. Yeah, uh, I have a double burner forge, a single burner forge, a seventy pound, seventy six pound anvil, and a fifty five pound anvil. And that's basically it. Uh, some hammers that I got from Harbor Freight because again I forge on a budget. Yeah. And luckily because of the the those that that's that that was a setup as you remember it, or the the setup that you remember. I only had two grinders. 
Right. And uh, right. Uh, my 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 drill press and uh, my bandsaw, and I mean I still have all that, uh, but we've added grinders. And starting this year, we added another two burner forge and another. 76 pound anvil oh that's great courtesy of donations coming from that group of 23 23 families families yes that that came through uh yeah that uh i remember i told you i, I can get you know five or six people through here through there at in a weekend you know you start on saturday you work out walk walk out sunday with a fully functioning knife and a sheath uh, it took me a little longer for them uh i, had, I think it took uh. us Total of four sessions total to get everybody through, but I wanted to get everybody through before we closed down for the season so that everybody had something to, to walk away from. And I'd have to wait six months before having to come back and start from where they left off. So we were able to do it. I'm not sure how. Uh, there was a lot of not yelling, but uh, stern <laughs> uh, stern exchanges between me and my wife. Uh, you met my daughter, Crystal. Yes, and you, the, the one you did me was my son-in-law, who are who had become my two apprentices. So between all four of us, we were able to juggle from forging to grinding to fit and finish to finish product. Uh, I think my wife affixed I don't know like ten, fifteen handles in one day. Mm. And I mean, I showed you the process, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit of a waiting process because you have to wait for the glue to dry. But uh, yeah, it, it was. It was a little hectic, but, you know, every day we walked away like, hey, this is what we wanted. So, you know, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, right. So what do you get out of teaching forging? What what has been uh, your your main takeaway? Uh, passing on uh, uh, the, the, the art of forging. Uh, it's it's seen a little bit of a resurgence because of, of shows that have come on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, but in essence, a dying art. Uh, it, it, not a lot. A lot of people would rather just go out and buy a stamped knife instead of buying something from somebody who makes it. And most of the time, it's a price difference. So what I get out of it is passing on this art. And when I see a, a seven, eight-year-old boys and girls, uh, you know, from seven to eighteen, showing interest in it, then it, it, it kind of shows that I'm leaving a legacy. For, for, for others to follow. I don't care if they only make one knife or if they make a thousand knives. They, if, if they can always say, I made this. So that's the main thing I get out of it. I was uh, I was an NCO for, I, mean, I was, uh, I was uh, an, an army leader for, I don't know, over half of my career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was passing on my knowledge to my soldiers. And this is kind of the same thing. I'm just passing on my knowledge, what I have of bladesmithing onto others my age and younger. Some older. Uh, we've had everything from, you know, Vietnam vets to, like I told you, to a seven-year-old come through there. So what, what would you tell a veteran who may be listening, s suffering from PTSD, you know, but can't find a way through? How did you find a way through? Uh, what value do you see in the creative process? Just look for something to do. Some of the PTSD, our worst enemy is being idle. Uh, as I say, you know, idle is the devil's workshop. No idle hands are the devil's workshop. And if you're idle, you start thinking about the most mundane things that really shouldn't matter, but they do to you. If you find something to do, if you find something to look forward to, to doing, then it kind of gives you something to look forward to. Unfortunately, I've gotten a lot of them course like, hey, when are you guys going to open back up? When are you guys going to open back up? And unfortunately, there is that downtime. But in that downtime, I encourage everybody, hey, I showed you how to make your first knife. You come up with a, a design of your own. And we can we can make it. So the main thing is, is, is get out of your head, get out and do something, whether it's coming to Bladesmith or whatever, but do something. So you talk about having something to look forward to. So I watched you in the forge. It's obviously a passion for you. But what what about the forging process? Do you look forward to the most uh, as you embark on a on a new new project, on a new knife? Actually, just the, the actual art of forging pieces of steel. Even though the guy that taught me said, you know, you need to, and a lot of bladesmith, you know, you, you need to draw out your design. Um, that's just not the way my brain works. I can draw something out. It's not going to look the same. So I just take a piece of steel. I kind of have in my mind what I want to do. And at the end of the day, I allow the steel to talk to me and to take shape to whatever it wants. And that's kind of what 
that's kind of what how, what my process is. Spoken like a true artist, uh, uh, painters and writers will and and others will tell you uh, just as much. You know, it's the same thing. The the writing dictates where the story is going to go. You know, when you're in that part of the process, when you're not in the refining process, but in the purely creative part, or the paintings telling me where to go, or or what have you. Uh, I watched your process, and I watched this knife, which I have right in front of me, uh, that you made me on that day. I watched this take shape, and uh, by the way, this looks like a roach belly to me, which is a traditional <laughs> um, traditional American kind of trapper's knife, and uh, I think that's really cool. I love I love the American knife heritage, and uh, you knocked it out of the park with that one. Yeah, that that's kind of what I always say. It's kind of my uh, what I call a a, a POK is is a plain old knife. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's got a pointy end, a, a holdy end, a cutty end, and a sticky end. So you know, it 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 all <laughs> it, it it does what what you need a knife to do. So uh, tell me about your favorite knife that you've created, or tell me about your favorite you know, what what your favorite knives are. I know you have that Thor hammer around your neck. I, I like uh, the Sax knives, or, or or which are the are the traditional Viking. Uh, knives, whether it be a sword or just a handheld knife, uh, I like making those. Uh, and the main thing is, it's, it's a simple design, but it's an effective design. Uh, I have made a, a traditional Japanese uh, single layer. I, I didn't make any any uh, folded steel, but a, a, a traditional Japanese tanto, which is a lot like what people think when think of a tanto is is that that sharp forty five degree angle. Uh, well, the Japanese Tanto it doesn't have that sharp of an angle. It's more of a of, of a rounded angle. Hmm. And I made one of those, and I actually carved out this side and the suka or the sheath and the handle out of the same piece of wood. Uh, the Japanese style of knife, as opposed to the European Scandinavian style of knife, it's it's night and day. The Japanese are very precise, exacting. While the Germanian or, or or Scandinavian style of knife is, hey, make make me something that'll that'll that I can stick into stuff and that I can cut stuff with. Doesn't have to be fancy, doesn't have to be pretty. Just make sure that it can do those two things. Between those two, those two are are, are my two favorite knives. Depending on how I'm feeling that day, what what I want to make. Uh, I think there at the end of the year, I made a 12 inch uh, long blade, uh, kind of a Japanese tanto. Actually, that was almost a small Japanese katana style knife. Oh, nice, yeah. But instead of the instead of using the the hidden tank, which requires a lot more work, I just went ahead and made it with a what's what, like the one that you have. It's called a full tank, which is, isn't hidden in anything. It's just there with two pieces of wood on either side. Arguably, the strongest construction there is, right? I mean, because it's a it's a bar of steel with a handle on it, as opposed to a a blade with a with a tapering tang that notches into a a handle. Yeah. It's so do you do you have any stories from the forge anything crazy anything fun dangerous or stupid stories from the forge it seems like the kind of place where crazy things can happen being a novice knife maker uh, uh stock reduction i've had a few close calls with the angle grinder and the cutout wheel but uh knock on wood well most of my finger uh most of the uh the the, the my fingertips are are back uh they're not cut up or, or, or ground up. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a dangerous process, uh, if you're not careful, but yeah, it, it's, anything can happen. The main thing is, uh, remember when I showed you my, my buffing wheel? Yes. Yes. Right, right now it's actually one of the most p dangerous pieces of equipment in the shop. You figure playing with fire and, and, and hot the, the buffing wheel. And, uh, I actually had to ban, jokingly ban my, uh, my son-in-law, who's my apprentice. And, Another friend of mine, who's a former soldier of mine, who comes out there every weekend, uh, his his name's Keith Shugart, so we just call him Sugars. <laughs> and I had to quote unquote ban them from using the uh, the buffing wheel because they lost control of their knives and they went flying across the room. Uh, luckily, they weren't that sharp. Luckily, it went across the room. <laughs> yeah, and not in them. Yeah. Uh, so the same two, they 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 tried getting creative with some Kydex. Uh, and it didn't turn out very well, so I banned him from that for a week or two. Uh, we 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 actually have like four or five rules, and then one of those rules is that uh, uh, Eric and Sugars are are not allowed to play with the Kydex anymore. <laughs> uh -huh. And they and and you know, and, and uh, my wife has to wear gloves because she, I think she shaved off a couple of her knuckles because wasn't wearing any gloves when she should have been. 
we do everything as safely as possible without being too uh, too regimented. Well, not regimented. Not, we like to have fun. Not too rigid. Rigid. There you go. You know, uh, um, sometimes, uh, like in, in my limited experience, I wonder if sometimes it's a little bit of the, the danger factor in using some of these tools. And, uh, you know, it's not like I use the tools eight hours a day every day. I'm not, I'm not a master at any of this stuff. So when I am using the tools, when I do have time to carve out to do some knife making, uh, I'm using these relatively powerful and dangerous tools, but I'm not that used to them. I haven't put that many hours into it. So sometimes I feel like uh, the danger inherent in that is what allows me to remain very focused. Well, and, and that's that's another thing that, that helps kind of helps us focus. Uh, you know, if you do, you know, if you do drop a piece of steel, it's that's, you know, 1200, 18, 2200 degrees. It's going to hurt. So <laughs> and yeah. you, you're kind of cognizant on that. So. What do you see in the future for uh, Recovery Forge? And, uh, you know, where where do you see it going in the next, you know, bit of time? And how about your own knife making? How do you see that growing? We're starting our second year this year with, with the workhouse. And we're still, our main goal there is to find us a place that we can do that indoors, that it's safe, so that we can do this year round. That's kind of what we what we want. We keep, there, there's a lot of interest. Uh, there, there's been, a, there's been, uh, the workhouse is still, they're still promoting our program uh, as much as they can every time they have an outing. I see it growing into a, a, a permanent position or a permanent building so that we can do it year round. Uh, I see us expanding probably to another forge if, if, uh, you know, if we keep going the way we, the way we're going. But right now we have two burners and a, a and a single burner. So that should, that should suffice us for now. And as, as more word go, gets out, I'm, I'm hoping that more people, that I see more more faces and that I see even familiar faces because I, I would like this to uh, not be just a, a one time. If, if that's what they want, then, you know, if it's a one time hit or, you know, hit and gone, then that's fine. Uh, but I want the I want our, as we call them, students to continue to come out and take part so that it, be, it can become part of, like I was saying, something that they look forward to doing with their husband, their wife, their kids on the weekend and to have fun with it. Uh, the main thing is I want it to grow and I want that as many, I want to help as many people as I humanly can. And if I can accommodate, I'll, I'll accommodate as many as I can. I mean, if I accommodated 23 families with a two burner and a single burner, I think uh, uh, expanding to uh, another double burner and uh, and another better uh, anvil uh, will allow me to, I would say uh, double that, but we'll see. Well, so how can people find Recovery Forge online or find more information out about you? If you live in Northern Virginia, how can people link up with you in the spring? Our main information, main source of information that we put out through is through our Facebook page. And you can search Recovery Forge. Mm -hmm. uh, if you there's there's actually two out there. Uh, ours is the one it's easy to identify because it's it's our symbols and eclipse. It's actually a picture that a friend of ours took. Uh, it, it's an eclipse and it's the one here in Northern Virginia. I can't remember where the other one's at, but you can, the main thing is, is Facebook. We also have an Instagram, which is also Recovery Forge. And if you go on to the workhouse in Lorton, Virginia, on um, their page, they have the military and the arts initiative and you can find us through there as well. Uh, and if nothing else, just show up to the workhouse and start, you know, yelling for, for bladesmiths and we'll eventually answer if we can hear you. <laughs> But another thing that I can't remember what I, if I had said it before, but the the other thing that we wanted to that we want to continue to, to remind people is that we're free of charge. We we don't charge our students anything. We take donations of I think we've been doing anything from food to money, to materials, food, money. Uh, it it doesn't matter. But that's not a a prerequisite for somebody to show up. And the main thing, the main reason we wanted to do that is because. We want to remove that barrier, the barrier of, of some sort of cost away from a veteran who may be on edge, veteran, first responders, uh, police officers, fire, you know, they see just as much. We want to remove that barrier of cost. We want them to be able to just show up. You know, that might be the difference between them becoming another of the 22 veterans that commit suicide on a daily basis. And if that's the difference between them and uh, between them doing that and coming out, then we've, we've, we're, we're good with that. 
we're for the most part, uh, I'm in a position where we're both, we, we can, I can self fund both me and my wife can self fund the program for the most part. So we do, we do take donations and we got a very large one from uh, the guys up on post guys and gals up on post, which allowed us to expand our, 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 our thing. But the main thing is, is that this is free. We're, we're, we're not expecting any money from you. We're not expecting, heck, we don't, you don't even need to talk to us. Just you know, short of where's the hammers, where's the tongs and where's the forge. I'm good with that. Uh, that's the main thing. We, we want to remove that barrier from someone that may want to come out that may be on edge. Well, Adam, I think you and Donna are doing a great thing, uh, not only in bringing um, the creative life to some vets who may be suffering and helping them out with that, but you know how I feel about knives. I think I think if you're bringing the creative process and you're teaching someone how to make a useful tool that they can hand down to the next generation, that's just, uh, I mean, that's a great way of healing, if you ask me. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, Adam. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. No problem. And I hope to see you out there this spring. Yeah, I will be there this spring. Myself, my brother-in-law, and a couple of friends. Sounds good. All right, Adam. Take care. All right, you too. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Kind of a different little interview this time, Bob. Um, interesting combination. Uh, an army vet uh, making knives, but kind of that, again, as the name implies, recovery forge. Kind of that recovery aspect of knife making as well. Just a, kind of a fascinating interview, I felt, I thought. Yeah, he's uh, he's not a knife obsessive like I am, and he's not <laughs> someone who has, has always been a collector. Here is someone who discovered uh, how knives fit into his life, the value of knives through healing and through teaching other people to uh, heal from PTSD through the creative process. And, uh, and you know, there is really something to be said about looking at a lump of raw steel and then taming it through heat and right. pressure and percussion. And uh, I can really see how it's just very, it could be very germane to a vet. Yeah, for just great interview, and thanks for uh, for him for doing that, and thanks for folks for listening. And if you happen to be uh, in the Northern Virginia National Capital Region and you want to check out Recovery Forge, uh, again, go to the Facebook and uh, search for Recovery Forge. Again, remember, there's uh, there's two, so just look for one with the, the Eclipse logo. Uh, Bob, want to quickly uh, kind of hit some of the upcoming knife shows uh, for March and maybe look ahead a little bit in uh, April. March 15th, uh, Dalton, Georgia Knife Roadshow is going to be at the Northwest Georgia Trade and Convention Center. Uh, March 29th through 30th, that starts the International Custom Cutlery Exposition. That's at the Stockyard Station. A local event to us uh, in Virginia. It's the uh, 28th Annual Greater Shenandoah Valley Knife Show. That's uh, April 5 through 7. Uh, getting into the month of April, about mid-April, April 13 and 14. It's the 44th Annual Oregon Knife Show. And then uh, kind of to wrap up April, April 27th, it's the 37th Annual NCCA Extravaganza Knife Show. Again, that's April 27 and 28. Just a few of the events on the Knife Junkie uh, calendar calendar of knife shows and knife club events you can find at the knifejunkie.com slash calendar. Bob almost forgot. Let's go back and let's talk about that AD10 video. We told folks at the beginning there was going to be some news about that. We kind of teased it. I'll let you spill the beans. Well, yeah, as a, as a lifelong um, uh, devotee to cold steel knives, especially since 2006, when Andrew Demko came on the scene and introduced his triad lock uh, through cold steel knives and uh, started designing uh, uh, the lion's share of their knives. I've been a huge fan of him. And then uh, when the AD10, the AD15 came out and I got them in hand and, and was moved, I know that sounds corny, but was moved by their, their beauty and, and their design and uh, just the meticulosity that went into creating them, that I, I reached out to Andrew Demko and he's going to come on the podcast. And we're going to wow. talk to him about the creation of the triad lock, the scorpion lock, being an innovator cool. and, uh, and whatever else comes up. Looking forward to that and meticulosity. Or I, I, I could have just made that, that up. <laughs> I could have just been. made that up. But you, you knew what I meant. 
That, well, I did. And this is and, how language evolves. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, if you want to Google that and let us know if it is a real word or not, uh, you can call the listener line at 724-466-4487. Let us know about that or any other uh, knife-related news or subjects or questions that you may have. Love to hear back from you. Again, the Knife Junkie listener line, 724-466-4487. Give us a call. Let us know what's on your mind. Bob? Final words from the knife junkies. We'll wrap it up. Uh, I would just, and don't don't say meticulosity or whatever. <laughs> I won't. I would just say uh, look for opportunities to uh, uh, you know if it's within your capability, look for opportunities to do the kind of thing that Adam is doing. Uh, reach out and help in any way you can. Uh, for me, it's spreading the word. For Adam, it's helping people make knives. But a lot of people come back uh, and need some help. So if you can reach out, see what you can do. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.